Back, uh, Senator Seward. Thank you. I rise to make a contribution to debate on this particular piece of uh, legislation, um, which, as Senator Waters and Senator Mills have articulated uh, very clearly, um, we don't support. I rise to speak on this um, and give some examples about why it is so important that we don't hand off all these powers. And Senator Back, I would also like to address some of the points that Senator Back brought up because I was actually involved in a number of uh, the debates over the particular projects that Senator Back cites as um, examples about why powers should be handed off. And I'll address those first. In terms of the Mangles Bay and seagrass beds, the issue there is because the company and the people that have repeatedly impacted on seagrass beds in Coburn Sound and that particular area had not been able to demonstrate that they could, in fact, return those particular types of seagrass beds and prove that they could grow it and sustain it. And so, although they made claims at the time that they would be restoring two or three times more seagrass than they destroyed, they could not prove that it could be grown. They also failed consistently to take into account cumulative impacts. So if you're going into a pristine environment, and this is the same repeatedly across Australia, or companies will go on and say, oh, we can, manage the, we can manage the impacts, there'll only be a small impact, but fail to take into account that we have we are not dealing with pristine environments anymore. We have, as a country, significantly damaged large areas of Australia. So you can't consider a project in isolation. I'd like to address three, just give three examples about why this particular piece of legislation will be a disaster for situations in Western Australia. And first, I'd like to go to the sharks and the fact that. And each of the examples I use here um, use, the, the, use the, a common factor of it being the state government who are the proponents in these examples. So, great white sharks and the culling of sharks in Western Australia, it is the state government that are the proponents. And what you're saying is the state government should now be doing their own assessment of their own project. And guess what? I'd give you 99.9% .9 certainty that they're going to say, this is a fantastic idea, like they're doing for the sharks, and they're failing to tell us information about the sharks. So, for example, it's the, it's the government, on no scientific basis, ignoring over now 300 scientists, marine scientists and, and um, ecologists, who know a little bit about what they're talking about, saying this is a bad idea, ignoring that, failing to tell the, the community and the EPA that, in fact, there had been some surveys done of what the community thinks. And this goes to the point that Senator Back made that if this isn't acceptable to the, if projects aren't acceptable to the community, well, that's one of the indicators it's, it's not very good and that it wouldn't unlikely to get up. Well, a community overwhelming in Western Australia does not support the shark. Cull, which fortunately now um, is being subject to uh, federal assessment. It's in the process of being, um, of being subject to federal assessment now. But the recent um, research paper, which was reported by, uh, commissioned by the state government, so we're told, wasn't previously released to the, w to, um, the WA. Uh, to the WA community, and the findings show that majority of respondents surveyed do not support the killing of sharks off the coast in an effort to reduce the risk of shark incidents. It also provided insight into what West Australians thought about the risks posed by sharks and how they um, should be dealt with. Fairfax Media obtained a copy of the research, which was compiled by Market Force and based its findings on responses of 768 West Australians. Less than 20 per cent of respondents said they agreed that culling sharks that, that they agreed with culling sharks um, on the, that came near the coast of Western Australia. More than 50 per cent of respondents also said they needed they they all that that said although more needed to be done about sharks, culling was not the answer. And, it, and the survey um, also showed that most respondents do not believe there was anything that could be done to increase the safety of water users from sharks. And the top response to the question, what else do you think should be done about sharks 
um, off the West Australian coast was nothing. Most respondents believe that individuals were responsible for ensuring their own safety about sharks, with the state government the second most voted for option um, when, when it came to responsibility for safety. The survey identified increased aerial surveillance as an initiative that made more people inclined to use beaches in the metro area, while in regional areas this corresponding initiative was warning, warnings of the tag sharks from WA's um, shark monitoring network. This is clearly a, an issue that the state government should not be let anywhere near approval of, because they are the proponents. This is crazy thinking. It's absolutely crazy that they could ignore the science. It was a knee-jerk reaction, in, built to get, he thought he'd get him a little bit of lift in the polls, but it didn't because most West Australians don't support it. Why would you think it's appropriate to hand over that decision to the state government on its own project? Then, of course, um, the, there's the James Price Pope proposal, which the state government was, was the proponent for compulsory acquiring the land, was pushing the joint ventures to go there, then carrying out its own assessment, which was rejected by the court, and they'd have to do it again. Why would you expect that they are going to carry out an unbiased assessment when they are the proponents? Again, crazy thinking. It's why you cannot hand off these, uh, these, approval, these approval processes. And then another example is the Carnaby's cockatoo. And anybody in Western Australia, and particularly Perth, knows about Carnaby's cockatoo. And you get this most wonderful sense every time you hear them and see them flying um, near you. They, uh, the BirdLife Australia has been conducting the great cocky count in Western Australia um, for a significant period of time, people, I think, I'm sure, Australia-wide know um, the wonderful work that they do, and they've just released another report in Western Australia on, on Carnaby's cockatoo. Now we know they have been um, declining, um, but the, over the last five years, the cocky count has now in Western Australia has now documented an annual decline of 15% in Carnaby numbers, and this is now sparking very strong fears that the species could be ext extinct on the Swan Coastal Plain within the next um, 20 years. The species have lost considerable habitat. A thousand hectares of Swan Coastal Plains native um, vegetation is, has, uh, is being cleared every year, and this is critical habitat um, for the birds. Now, what's been happening is that we get this wonderful offsets theory, and they allow clearing in, in the metro area and say, well, it'll be offset somewhere else because we'll protect a bit of bush um, elsewhere. That, of course, is not in the metro area where the cockies are. Now, the birds, not being able to access the native vegetation, have actually then been making the pine plantations just north of Perth their home, and they've done that very effectively. However, we now have the, the pine plantations are having a negative impact both on um, the water table, the groundwater table on which Perth um, depends, but a lot of our ecosystems depend, and particularly um, some of the species using the Yanchep caves. Of course, very complex ecological equations. The new habitat that they've been moved in, that they have moved into, the pine plantations, are now being cleared off the, um, out of the Nangara pine plantation. That is now impacting on the numbers of cockatoos. Now, this is where it gets complicated, is because you've got, as I've just said, the pine plantations are having an impact on the, um, the water table and on um, Yanchep caves and some uh, particular species in the Yanchep caves. But the point here is, is the vegetation is being cleared and not replaced. It's not being staged. And so what needs to, what, this is a species that's actually listed under the Environmental Protection Biodiversity Conservation Act, so it's a trigger for Commonwealth um, involvement. What we think needs to happen there is there does need to be an assessment. Again, here, it's the state government that are the proponents of the clearing. And they're very often the people that give the permission to, to clear um, some of the Banksy woodland, woodland that is particularly important. And I'll, I'll note here too that there's been an ongoing um, issue in Western Australia um, for the Underwood Bushland, uh, Underwood Avenue Bushland, which the University of Western Australia owns, to clear that. Again, that's very critical uh, uh, habitat for the Carnaby's cockatoo. 
And as BirdLife Australia's Head of Conservation, Samantha Vine, says, the Nangara um, plantation is the single most important feeding habitat for the species on the Swan Coastal Plain. It sustains thousands of carnabees for several months each year. She, she said, however, its trees are being harvested and not replaced, taking away a major source of food and important roosting sites. Um, and, and she the, goes on to say that there needs to be um, action taken. This is another example where the state government is the proponent of what's happening. They also have the solution at hand. They could and should be making sure that there is habitat available and planned in advance for the for the um, replacing that that pine plantation as it is cleared, because they have known for a long time that that has become critical replacement habitat for Carnaby's um, cockatoo. I certainly don't want a metro metropolitan Perth um, that. Uh, a situation where metropolitan Perth no longer hears the cries and sees the magnificent sight of the Carnaby's cockatoo. Yet another example of where we need the, environmental power, the federal government to have environmental powers. Because I'm sorry, the state government has demonstrated in Western Australia again and again that we need the federal government to have environmental powers because, in some instances, they are incapable of making the decision. Sharks is a classic example. I'm deeply worried about the future of Carnaby's cockatoo since it's to date they have shown no ability to keep planning to make sure that their, uh, this habitat um, is replaced. James Price Point. If the company hadn't have pulled out, making the decision somewhat different, the state government would have approved that proposal. That's why we need federal government to have the powers and use the powers that are available under the Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act. It is not good enough just to rely on the state, because they will not do the right thing. They put development ahead and it's quite of, of, in, of protecting the environment. And it was quite obvious in Western Australia that that's exactly what they were doing with James Price Point. In Western Australia, when James Price Point was being assessed, they couldn't find five, five, five members of the Environmental Protection Authority to actually make the decision, because four of them were conflicted. So it was left to one person. That's the mob that this federal government wants to hand over the powers to, to for approval. That is not good decision making. That is not protecting the environment. That will not protect the sharks of Western Australia. That will not protect Carnaby's cockatoo and all the other unique and special environments we have in Western Australia. We do not support handing over these approval powers and the one-stop shop. One stop shop. So many times I worked in the environment movement for a very long time before I came to this place. And consistently you'd hear, oh, the EPBC, the uh, Environmental Protection Act is holding in Western Australia is holding up all these developments. And when the EPA went and did an assessment of holding up all these developments, most of the time it was where they had gone back to industry and said, this, we need clarification of this particular point, or had done their bit of the assessment and were then waiting for or the process, then waiting for the particular proponent to get back to them. It was, it was actually the, the proponents themselves that were the blockage. They use people, some people who want to weaken our Environmental Protection and Biodiversity Conservation Act, who want to weaken our state acts as well, use the argument of red tape and blockages as a way of undermining environmental protection. There's not a doubt in my mind that if they had their druthers, they would actually not want any environmental protection legislation at all and they use red and green tape as an excuse for actually what they really want to do is get rid of environmental laws. Well, we're not going to support that. We need strong environment, a stronger Environmental Protection Act, not weakening it and not handing over to states that are the proponents of many of the proposals that are getting assessed. We will not be supporting this legislation.